about an argument for creation, the famous classic argument from design, nowadays often called intelligent design theory, and the religious people complain that in the public schools they're very one-sided, they only teach one of the theories, they only teach the theory of evolution, that the universe was formed by random chance, combination of matter and motion in space through time, they don't teach the other theory, intelligent design theory. This isn't the public schools, and I will go through briefly intelligent design theory, the argument from design. Traditionally, this is the famous clockmaker argument, the watchmaker argument. Like a watch, the universe is intricate and complicated. When you find something intricate and complicated, like a watch, you know it has to have a designer. If you find just a pile of rocks, that doesn't need a designer. But if you find a watch that does need a designer, and just like a watch, the universe, intricate and complicated, how all the parts interwork together, forming a beautiful, harmonious whole. The criticism of the argument from design doesn't prove that God is infinite. We can't tell that the universe is infinite, the philosopher Hume said. Of course, to some extent, this may just be a limitation on our ability to tell. But it doesn't take an infinite God to create a finite universe. It doesn't take infinite power to create something finite, only enough power to create something finite. This, by the way, is where I got the inspiration for what I called earlier the radical critique. Nothing, no matter how big, would prove the existence of God. Could just be something very powerful after all. No matter how big it is, it wouldn't take an infinite amount of power to produce it. Just enough power to produce it. So God doesn't necessarily have to be infinitely powerful. Also, God doesn't have to be good. I take this one a little bit more seriously. The traditional problem of evil. If God is all-powerful and if God God is also all good. Why is there evil in the world? There is evil in the world. So if God is all powerful, then he must not be all good. Otherwise, he would stop it. And if God is all good and there's evil in the world, then he must not be all powerful or he would stop it. So either way, God is not all powerful or God is not all good. Furthermore, there's no reason why there should only be one God. After all, many people get together to make a watch, and so maybe there were many gods got together to make the universe. Now, generally speaking, when we get many people together, we have men and women working together, so maybe there are men and women gods creating the universe. When you get men and women together, you know what happens next sex and reproduction. So maybe the gods have sex with each other and reproduce and create new gods. Whose theology is this? This isn't Judeo-Christian theology anymore where there's one god, all-powerful, all good. Here there are many gods, limited god, finite gods, maybe not all good, maybe mischievous, running around having sex with each other, producing other gods. This isn't Judeo-Christianity anymore. This sounds more like the god of the ancient Greeks or the ancient Romans. So even if the argument works, it doesn't get you what they wanted it to get you, the god of Judeo-Christianity. But furthermore, Further, the deeper criticism of the watchmaker argument is that that isn't the only possible rendering of the movements of the solar bodies. We also have the Copernican view, the concentric circles around the sun. This could look like the cross-section of an onion or the cross-section of a tree. Does that need a designer? I mean, if the solar system, if the universe is like a pile of rocks, that doesn't require a designer. If it's like a watch, watches do require designers. But what about onions? What about trees? Do they require designers? Isn't that really the question? Can't they just grow naturally? And more than once I had students put up their hands, extra credit, and say it also looks like the revolution of the electrons around the nucleus of an atom. 
great. That isn't even a living thing. Isn't that just natural forces, the force of attraction, the force of gravity? Regular force creates regular motion. The orbit of the moon around the Earth, just the interplay of the gravity of the moon with the gravity of the Earth. Regular force creates regular motion, creates the illusion of design, isn't really necessarily design. And so the argument falls into inconclusiveness. It doesn't really work. And I've tried to point out, of course, that God doesn't want to give us an argument that works. God wouldn't want to give us a proof of his existence. If we knew for sure there is a God watching me, then I would be intimidated. I wouldn't be able to show my true desires, and God wouldn't be able to judge me. And so the argument doesn't work. And now, finally, the argument for evolution. And I like to put this in terms of a famous 19th century physicist named Pierre Simon Laplace wrote a book on nature, gave it to the Emperor Napoleon, reads the book, says to Laplace, nice book, but I don't see any chapter on God in your book. And Laplace replies, famously, God, I have no need of this hypothesis. Laplace thought he could explain everything perfectly well, just using evolution alone. Evolution alone is the best theory, although sometimes creationists like to say, well, why can't we use both God and evolution? And usually creationists are driven to say include evolution because it seems pretty obvious from the fossil record and so forth. Some evolution, evolution has occurred, but why can't God have set things in motion according to the theory of evolution? Why can't we say God and evolution? And while that's possible, and by the time I'm done, I'll try to show some reason to think that maybe it's true. While it's possible to say that, that's not the simplest explanation. We prefer the simplest explanation, sometimes called Occam's razor, cut out what you don't need. Why use more than you need to multiply causes without necessity is not good science or philosophy. Why use God and evolution when evolution alone is enough? Why use two causes? when one of them alone, when evolution alone is enough, can explain everything again. Here's how. In the beginning there was matter. Matter always was. Doesn't help in any way to say God always was. Doesn't help to get us started to add God always was. Matter always was. That gets us started. Infinite time gets the, us the origin of life infinitely. Random mutation, natural selection gets us everything else right down to and including human beings and how we evolve to have intelligence, language, morality, and religion. So cut out God. You don't need God. Evolution alone can explain everything, and evolution is closer to my past experience. We prefer theories that are close to my past experience. If I come home after work and find my house has been broken into, who do I blame? Drug-crazed teenagers or thieving ghosts? Drug-crazed teenagers, of course, I have lots of experience with them. They're running all over the neighborhood, stealing everything that isn't nailed down, taking that to the pawn shops, getting money to buy drugs. I've never seen any ghosts. If I was in a place where there were lots of ghosts and no drug-raised teenagers, that would be my favorite explanation. So we have lots of experience with evolution. I have no experience with God. I know my infinitesimal calculus, of course, and so I know no matter what the odds are against life forming, we have eternity, we have infinity, life will get started an infinite number of times. We have lots of experience with mutation all around us today, genetically modified foods, animal husbandry, creating different kinds of meat, more lean, less fat, and so forth. We have the fossil record, and so lots of 
evidence for evolution. That's like the drug crazed teenagers running around. I see them all over the place. I see them everywhere. I don't have any experience with God. That's like saying ghosts stole my silverware. I have no experience with any such thing. Don't go making up new things. Stick to what you know. We have lots of experience with evolution. No experience with God. Evolution, just like the teenagers stealing my stuff, is the favorite theory. But the creationist replies now, we have one experience that evolution cannot account for, and that is the experience that we are free. Humans are free. Matter is not free. Matter moves according to laws, laws of physics, laws of chemistry, laws of biology. When rain falls on the mountainside, it does have any freedom. Shall I flow right or shall I flow left? Shall I flow down or shall I flow up for a change? Matter moves according to laws. Human beings are free. Therefore, the creationist claims there must be something more to the universe than matter, because matter isn't free and humans are free. I like to call this spirit, something spiritual. And by that spirit, spiritual, all I mean is something that's not matter, not material, not subject to the laws of nature. Free. The evolutionist replies, no, you are not free. You think that you're free. Science will prove that that's an illusion. Mm -hmm.